Good evening and welcome to Business 7. More than ever before, mining has the power to fuel the Namibian economy and that's one of our focus points this evening. We'll be right back. Connection. It's in the human touch, the feeling of belonging. It inspires us and empowers us, creates clarity from complexity. It starts new conversations, unlocks the power of advice and makes an impact on your life. At Alex Forbes, we pioneer insight to provide you with advice that connects your decisions of today to your impact tomorrow. Before we start with the more formal part of tonight's um, program, Happy Valentine's Day! Who said economics can't be romantic? Now, the Namibia Statistics Agency has released some data just um, to show how important the day of love is. And one of the figures that they've released is all about a chocolate. Now, in February last year, Namibia imported um, more than $12 million worth of a chocolate that was about double the value of uh, the previous month and the NSA data show that a chocolate to the tune of 8 million was important in uh, imported in February 2022. They also released some data about flowers showing that last year uh, we imported flowers to the tune of $700,000 in February, no doubt, filled by Valentine's Day and compared to February 2022 when that amount was 400,000. Happy Valentine's Day! It's not just Namibia that goes crazy uh, on Valentine's Day. Reuters has released a video about global cocoa prices that's gone through the roof last week in uh, the running up to Valentine's Day. Let's take a look. Cocoa beans are a hot commodity right now. In fact, they've never been more expensive, and that's bad news for chocolate lovers everywhere. Benchmark cocoa futures have hit all time highs in New York, approaching $5,900 per tonne. That's close to twice the level this time last year. Prices have jumped as poor harvests leave supplies running short. In number two producer Ghana, production is expected to hit half a million tonnes at best. That would be more than 150,000 tonnes down on the previous year. There's concern over the crop in top producer Ivory Coast too. Last week, a Reuters poll forecast a global deficit of 375,000 tonnes in total. That leaves firms scrambling for supplies and shoppers feeling the pinch. Data from consumer tracking company NIQ shows US chocolate prices rose 11% at the end of January. Hershey says it expects its sales to drop again as a result. In the fourth quarter, it saw volumes fall 6.6%. Rival Mondelez, maker of the Cadbury brand, also saw sales drop. And there is no relief in sight. Industry sources say it's feared the shortage could last into next year. Every day, you make choices that make you legendary. Journey together with us on the path to securing your legacy as a member of the League of Legends. With the Select Platinum Bundle Fee Premium Bank offering, you will access tools that will enable you to thrive. If you earn $850,000 Namibian dollars per annum or more, you can apply for this offering today via bankventure.com.na for only 447 Namibian dollars per month. Bank Venture, a member of Capricorn Group. Let's get serious. It's all about mining and the role it can play in Namibia going forward. Namibia Media Hub's mining guru, Argetu Craig, spoke to John Sese. He is the CEO of Ongapolo Mining Limited. Welcome to another exciting edition of Delve Deep Namibia. My name is Ogito Craig, and today I have the honor and privilege of picking the brain of Mr. John Sise, who is a veteran 
and very experienced with Namibian mining. Good day, Mr. Siso. Please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Um, good morning, and thank you for allowing me uh, this interview. My name is John Sisi, as you said. I've um, been in the mining space for about 30 years. I moved to Namibia about five years ago when we acquired a company called Ongopolo and uh, have been spending our time since then restructuring the company, expanding the resource base of the company and seeing how we can restart those old traditional mines, the Chudi mine near Sumib in the north. You've got the Ochihazi mine um, just near Vindukhe, the underground mine. These are all copper mines. And we also own the Berg Arcus zinc and lead mine. So our job basically has been trying to expand the resources, getting the right, right friends together and getting the right team so we can reopen those mines to benefit uh, the Namibian economy and start doing real copper volume out of Namibia. Thank you, Mr. Sise. And I must say, we're all holding our breath and hoping for your success. Could you give us an update to which of those mines looks like they might be able to get back into operation soon? Well, the primary one that we focused on has been the Chudi mine um, in, in the north. Um, when we took over the mine, it had uh, about just under a three year mine life. So we did some more extensive drilling and we're looking out at, at a mine life north of, of eight years, possibly more. Uh, but in the interim, what we've planned to do, whilst we continue the studies, we're in the process of uh, recruiting mining contractors and employing the right staff. We hope that we will, uh, by the by media, we'll start producing copper out of Chudi. Uh, and, and in the meantime, we're also carrying out studies to start um, the Ochihazi underground mines, both at Matchless and Ochihazi. And our goal is that by the end of the year, we'll start producing copper there as well. That That is really excellent news. Um, copper prices on the international market, you know, 10,000 US dollars per metric ton. How and why should that be the goal? Well, as you know, uh, it's, it takes quite a big to start these mines and we need uh, a sustainable price for, for, the, for, the, for the funds that are coming in to be able to establish these mines properly for the long term in a sustainable way. Now, we obviously have confidence that the, the world needs to up more, especially with the EV revolution that's happening now. So we're confident that that's a reasonable price to incentivize investment into this into these uh, various projects, not just for Namibia, but globally. Uh, if you would have read, some of the big companies call have stated that ten thousand price is the is the right delta for further investment uh, in, in uh, uh, opening new copper mines. But in terms of that price, we are just uh, we are we are just dependent on the market, or is there anything to to be that can be done? To, to sustain that price or to achieve it? Well, pricing is all about demand and supply. And if you look at the trajectory of, uh, of demand, it, it out, outweighs supply by a significant amount, especially going looking in the next five years. So that we think will put the upward pressure on the price. Um, and also when you look at the paradigm shift in terms of the use of copper uh, with electrical revolution, in terms, especially in terms of uh, electrical vehicles, uh, it's going to be hard push for the global market to be able to, to meet all of that demand in a timely way. So we think that there's going to be a hiatus where you'll see perhaps a price higher than 10,000, but we think 10,000 is where it should stabilize in the long term. And most uh, long term forecasts suggest that that's a reasonable assumption. Excellent, excellent. Let's take the focus a little bit away from what you're currently doing and tap into your vast experience. Let's look at Namibia's mining policies. Do you think uh, Namibia could be a blueprint for Africa? I think Namibia thus far has is making excellent progress in terms of the mining policy, but I think most mining policies are underpinned by the fundamental uh, reliability and the rule of law. And what we've seen historically in Namibia is there is a rule of law when it comes to mining contracts and the way they're implemented. Uh, we know that the court systems support um, the mining acts, the mining law. So we're, we're, we're very excited to be operating in Namibia as a jurisdiction. And in terms of the mining policy itself, you would have heard of recent moves by the government to uh, sort of encourage, let me use that word, mining companies to beneficiate more in country. And I think that is a, is a bold and a, and a required step that could put Namibia on the map, um, especially when it comes to 
um, EV minerals like your lithium and your copper. Yeah, and that, that leads me nicely into the next question, which is specifically about uh, Namibia's recent decision uh, not to export unprocessed ore. What do you think the impact of that decision is, but also what opportunities does it hold for the country? Well, I think the impact is, of course, that uh, producers now have to think about getting more capital and, and uh, developing more up, uh, downstream um, projects. Uh, in the terms of our situation, we obviously actually will be producing uh, completely beneficiated copper uh, to LME standards, and so the actual copper plates will go out, not not a concentrate or 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 the ore. But I think it's important for the country because you, you're expanding your footprint in terms of the value chain locally. That can only mean better skills development. It can mean better better jobs and higher and higher taxes and revenue to government, which is healthier for the overall economy. That's that's really excellent news. And do you think that you'll have uh, any spare capacity at Chudi, perhaps to help other copper miners locally to to improve their own beneficiation before they try to ship out of the country? Um, not so much at Chudi, although there's a potential there to expand. Uh, right now, the nameplate of Chudi is seventeen thousand tons per annum. Uh, we will we're doing a leach process there, which is slightly more complicated from a tolling perspective. perspective. Uh, but we can increase that to possibly 25,000 tons by making a few adjustments to the plant. The more exciting prospect is to look at uh, the Ochihazi underground mine because that's actually a flotation uh, concentrate producer. And it's much more easier to take um, uh, ore from discrete ore bodies that actually don't justify their own plants uh, in that area and, and toll treat it for them. So yes, there is that opportunity to help smaller producers to uh, to treat and, and, and beneficiate a bit more their, 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 their products. Excellent. Thank you. That's very good news. Looking even further abroad, you know, uh, the Global North, uh, they invest heavily in mining all over the world and also in Namibia. But uh, sometimes their investment priorities might uh, reflect some paternal instincts, for lack of a better term. How would you describe the situation and what do you think is a better way forward? I think increasingly people are beginning to understand that Africa uh, are partners now, and especially with the EV revolution, hence uh, that's why I support the government's position on beneficiation. We have to be equal partners, we know what the market prices are, we have competent people in country to be able to run these mines and we have to prioritise the localization, not only in terms of people, but also in terms of uh, the issue of contracts to help develop the, the local economy. So I think the paternal instinct of the past should should end. This is these are business relationships, and you can only have a sustainable business relationship if both parties benefit. Yes, indeed, indeed. Let's look a bit more at uh, what more can be done locally, specifically local supply chain development. What do you think the impact has been of what's happened already, and how can we encourage this and also ensure that it's sustainable? Well, I think obviously companies need to take a more proactive step in selecting local contractors um, and helping them to be able to supply uh, as we as as uh, to our needs, and that means you know putting a bit more time and allowing people to have the experience and working with the banks to provide the requisite finance for them to be able to execute those jobs. Uh, but they, in my experience in Namibia, most of the contracts that are uh, mining companies uh, require uh, available locally, and it's just uh, I the government policy of, of local first, both in terms of employment and contracts. Uh, I, I think that that benefits the the whole the whole space because the more suppliers you have it makes it more competitive for us as, as producers um so yeah I, I, it's, some, it's something we support completely excellent excellent uh, let me take this opportunity to pick your brain about other local mining developments what do you think about the current uranium rush we're experiencing in Namibia? well Namibia historically for years has been, has been uh, a significant uranium, uranium producer um, we now see, of course, the other uranium producers, I, I speak specifically those that are uh, in, in the Sahel region in uh, West Africa. Uh, we see all the instabilities there. So Namibia has always presented itself as a stable country. And so you will see, uh, for example, France and people and countries like that that are heavily dependent on nuclear power looking for secured supply. And in the long term, you want your secured supply. 
uh, from from reliable jurisdiction because uranium mining is a it's a heavy upfront capital investment and it's a long term project. Excellent. Now, what about diamonds? You know, we are also very dependent on that mineable resource. And in recent times, there's been a dip in the price, uh, especially for our type of uh, beautiful diamonds. What's your take on that situation? Well, I think well, diamonds have been forever and you have got a good reputable mining company here in, in, in Namdeb. But unfortunately, when there is uh, instability uh, in global uh, economic outlook, usually your luxury items, which uh, will suffer and you will see a reduction in price as a consequence of that. And as I understand it, uh, Namibia is a heavy producer in gemstones, high quality stones. So those are usually go, those will usually go into the jewelry market. And that, that is a, a slight, a sluggish growth, most, mostly because of, of, of um, you know, a global economic confidence with all that's going on. But I suspect when, once we return to growth, that also will, will, will turn the curve. Thank you. Uh, let's also look at iron. You know, we are not a big iron producer, but of late we've been making some headway into producing green iron. Do you think that Namibia has a, a legitimate opportunity in uh, better or more activity regarding iron? Namibia has this unique position. I think you have a great potential for being a supply base. Yes, you don't have the same uh, deposit in terms of iron or some of the other countries have, but what you do have is good infrastructure and a good port. And because iron ore is a, um, unless you're going to do actual mix steel locally, but it's, it's, it's a freight, it's as much a freight game as it is a mining game. So with the development with your ports in Warwish Bay, especially, and I know there are further expansion plans, that, that makes um, Namibia a very attractive place for that. Having said that, you do need to increase the amount of uh, iron ore that you produce locally, and that, that can only come for further exploration. Excellent. And let's also touch on the golden elephant in the room. Namibia does produce gold, but it's uh, often almost overlooked. And when we consider its uh, importance in a global economy, do you think that there's more that Namibia can do, especially in terms of helping the whole continent, Africa, to achieve more um, independence? Well, I mean, Namibia does produce good, and you've got a few good gold companies here. And, and I think where where the challenge is right now is explore is more is further exploration. I have no doubt there are all the potential significant mines in Namibia, but they require more exploration. And this usually takes, uh, you know, it's a, it's a two to seven year period to establish a, a proper gold resource that you can combine. Uh, also, again, gold presents an opportunity for refinery. And I don't know that you do enough of that here, but you can see there's a general trend now to, to refine the gold where it's, uh, where it's locally produced. So that's again, is an opportunity for the future in Namibia. Wow. Uh, you also did mention earlier a little bit about battery minerals, but I'd like you to expand about how, where you think Namibia is in terms of developing that resource and how best to go about it, uh, taking in account or, or, or drawing on your vast experience. Uh, I, I, sorry, I, I understand you talking about battery minerals. Battery minerals, including lithium and rare earth minerals and... Uh, also, to an extent, copper, but I wanted to, I wanted to leave that for the last. Okay. Well, you know, they all for, they all form part of this beneficiation drive that the government is having because obviously, uh, in things like lithium, which is not the simplest mineral to, to uh, process in the world, but if if Africa, if Namibia is going to have its seat in the future in terms of the economic, the electrical revolution, then it needs to invest in the infrastructure to be able to allow factories here. I don't think that in twenty twenty four we can argue that Namibia does not have the requisite expertise or could not train the re, uh, re, relevant people to be able to develop this, these, these things. It does take a commitment from the government in giving predictive and reliable um, fiscal uh, uh, situation in, incentives, but it also takes the investors to understand and believe that this has got to be the way forward in terms of, as we mentioned, uh, you know, having the continent really benefit for its, from, its, from its natural resources and not just become a supplier to aid other economies. Thank you, Mr. Sisse. I'd like us just to return to copper, just to finish up the, the interview, and specifically about what you mentioned earlier, your plan to produce copper plates here in Namibia, which hasn't been done before. I'd like to understand and for you to share with our viewers and listeners, why 
it hasn't been done before and what Namibia should do to help you to be able to produce uh, that kind of uh, end product locally? Well, to, to, if I can just correct you, it was done before, but at, at, at Ongapolo for, but not for a sustained period, uh, because of, as you might have been aware, Ongapolo did have some issues with re reference to um, the water ingress, but yes. we've we've got a good plan for that. We put that under control. The plan built in Chudi is to produce copper plate at LME standards of ninety nine point five percent copper. So, so I think uh, we're going to do that again uh, and do it in in a more sustainable way and. Or, and I, and I suspect that would encourage other companies to build SXW plants, which would produce that plated copper. Um, and also we look at, you know, um, using buying concentrate in and also developing that uh, through the smelter. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Sisa. Is there anything you'd like to say in parting uh, to our audience and is, uh, in regards to this brand new year, which uh, we are heading into? Well, thank you for, for, for the interview. Um, I would like to say it's going to be a, an exciting year. Of course, there's going to be challenges. The world still continues to be unpredictable, unpredictable and, and um, unreliable in a certain extent. But I think Namibia has a very positive and excellent future in mining. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not something that happens overnight. It does take a lot of investment and time in, in the earlier stage of exploration and mine development. But I think Namibia is a heavily underexplored country. Uh, so it, it presents a lot of opportunities for the future and we're looking forward to being part of it. Thank you, sir. And we wish you all the best for this year coming. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you also for your attention and for joining us as we delve deep Namibia. Until we do it again next time, have a great time. <laughs> <laughs>